I've been praying this week that as you hear the word of the Lord and the Spirit goes to work, that there would be someone from this congregation that would go to the nations to seek to establish a new church like this one. That's what I've been praying. And I don't know if they're nine or 90. Both would work. I don't know if they're a single or a married couple or a big family, but I've just been praying that God, by his spirit, would capture someone with the vision of Ephesians 3 and say, you weren't expecting it this morning, but the trajectory of your life has just changed for the sake of God's name and the good of those who are his yet don't yet know about him. Second, this text, I think, demands that all of us be changed. In other words, if we see what's here about the church and God's global mission in the church, all of us, as we're sitting here, would be amazed that right now God is speaking and shining light and showing his mystery to the cosmic forces of darkness as we gather now. Speaking to them and saying that they've lost and they've failed. And if you're in your neighborhood, you're the gospel witness God wants in your neighborhood. And you won't be able to leave this place and go, well, I hope somebody reaches my neighbors. You'll go, that's what God has the church for. So let me pray for us and we'll dive in here and pray God changes all of our lives uh, for the sake of his name. So Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you that I don't have to stand up here and try to work ourselves up into some sort of frenzy with uh, my emotions or my clever words, but Lord, that your words speak so clearly and so directly, and that by your spirit you'll come and you'll change us for the good of this place, for the good of these South Cities, and yes, Lord, even for the good of the nations, those peoples who have not yet heard your name. So come and do those miracles of your grace by your spirit, through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we take a week each year to think about, pray towards, and then hopefully stir ourselves up towards the calling of the church to make disciples of all peoples. Because we have amazing news. We have amazing news. We have news that Jesus takes rebels and he redeems them. <laughs> Isn't that amazing news? You're a rebel and you've been redeemed. We have this news that Jesus takes enemies and makes them family. That is amazing news. We have this news that Jesus takes sinners and saves them by his blood. And yet sometimes I wonder if in my own heart, in our own hearts collectively, we see the lost and the broken, the poor and the powerless we just sang about the way Jesus did. Sometimes I think it's easier for me to have a disposition of kind of frustrated and angry towards the lost in the world around us. Like, why are they doing that? <laughs> why are they doing those things? Right? Think of your least favorite people on the news. Those ones that your heart is stirred up in anger towards. Right? Think about those least favorite people across the globe. Right? There's always global news coming of horrible things being done. Think of the, the Taliban and groups like it. Do we, when we see the evil around us, not only pray against, stand against, expose the evil like we should, but do we have a heart of compassion for them as poor and powerless? So I want to read the words of Jesus in Matthew 9, 36 to 38, and have us remember that eventually Jesus would be crucified by probably one of these crowds that he's looking out on, one of these crowds that came to see his miracles and said they wanted to be all in with him, right? They wanted to be part of the show that they thought was going on. And here's what Jesus says about these folks who would likely eventually crucify him. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So this week we do every year is just us trying to obey that, at least stir you up to pray that the Lord would send out laborers into the harvest. So the question for us this morning is, as we look around, do we have a heart of compassion 
towards the harassed and the helpless. If we do, do we take Jesus up on his call to pray that laborers would, be go, would go into the harvest because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so our prayer today is that we'd be stirred up again for the lost, not just the lost around us, but the lost in the nations, and then eager, that you would leave here eager to find your place, your role, your calling, and God's grand plan of redemption because you've got a part. Everybody's got a part to play. So let's dive in here. Point number one is in the church, the mystery of Christ is revealed. In the church, the mystery of Christ is revealed. Look at verse one with me first. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles... And Paul is ready to jump into a prayer for the church. He's just talked about unity and peace among Jew and Gentile, about their story of salvation, how they were brought from darkness to light. So he's about to pray for them. And we're going to get to that prayer next week. But right as he's about to pray for them, as he sits chained in jail, something in him goes, I got to say more. (laughs) Got to say more about this new, amazing reality called the church. And so he dives into kind of this parenthesis saying, here's what the church is. Here's what God has done. Here's my calling. So let's look at verses 2 to 6. He says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you to show the mystery, to how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And here it is. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So Paul calls his ministry a stewardship of God's grace. Meaning, it's all God's grace. It's my job to to take that grace and act responsibly with it. Right? Do what he calls me to do with it. He's received a calling by grace. He's meant to carry it out by grace. It's not from him or about him, right? This calling is not from him or about him. Paul is probably the least likely person to preach a message of peace in Christ to the church. If you know Paul's biography, right, he was the one that was hunting down the early church to throw them in prison and stone them. Gentiles... Certainly, but also those Jews who are now following Christ. He was like, none of you get it. You're both wrong. And now here he is saying you're both one in Christ. Probably the most unlikely person. But God intervened right on that road. And he turned his life upside down and taught him about this glorious gospel so that for the rest of Paul's life, he could know what it means to be amazed by grace. (laughs) Right? No works of his own, but amazed and saved by grace. And this is how often God works. Using the least likely, the weakest, the people that seem the most far gone to accomplish his purposes all by grace. So if you're sitting there this morning feeling like, well, Pastor Dave said he's praying for someone, but it's not going to be me. I'm not very likely. You might be in trouble. Right? God might just want to use the, the least likely among us to go for the sake of his name. Kids, have you ever read a book or watched a movie where someone very unlikely kind of at the end is the hero of the story? Like you, you never could have seen it come. They seemed the weakest, right? the most helpless, right? the most unpopular, or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, they come in and they're the hero of the story. They're the one that God uses or that producer in the movie uses, right, to bring about the purposes that need to happen. And that's how God works a lot. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be powerful. You don't have to be impressive to be used by God. You just have to believe in him as your savior, savior and ask him to use you. And it's his strength and his power that works in you. And I'm just emphasizing this because one of the things that might keep you going from going to the nations, one of the things that might keep you from going and talking to your neighbor, right, if the nation seems really far, is that you think you need to be some superhero Christian. Like you need to have this unbelievable, this gift of evangelism. 
Now you need to be some super mature people that everyone wants to listen to all the time. But there are no superhero Christians. (laughs) There just aren't. You just believe in him as your savior and ask him to use you. There's just those who have received grace and they think that grace is so good and so sweet and so amazing that they want other people to have that grace with them. That's all there is in the Christian world. You can be used in your neighborhood or the nations. And in fact, I would say you can be used in the nations. And if you live in your neighborhood, so like if you go home and that's where you live, that's your neighborhood to reach with the gospel. That's how sure it is that God's determined our boundaries and our dwelling places. And as you witness in your neighborhood, perhaps you'll find him growing a heart for the lost, even in the nation. So what was the stewardship Paul was given by grace? To make known, he says, the mystery of Christ. That in Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, the Gentiles, that is the nations, the the peoples, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, through the gospel. Got to be in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And if you are... What do you get? You get to be fellow heirs. (laughs) What an amazing thing for these nations that were not a part of the people of Israel to hear. That means they have the same inheritance of eternity with Jesus that was promised in chapter 1. He's saying, you'll be with me forever. You'll be kept by my spirit. You belong to me. You're fellow heirs. It's all yours. The world is yours. The new heavens and new earth, yours. That's what he's saying to these Gentiles that would have felt so on the outside. He says, you're part of the same body, one new man, right? One body, not two different peoples going to Christ. One new man, one body in Christ. Peace with God brought in by the blood of Christ. Part of the fullness of the one who fills all in all. You remember that from chapter one? We, the church, the fullness of the one who fills all in all, adopted into that. And then finally, partakers of the promise, the promise of a Messiah, the promise of perfect offspring, the offspring of Abraham that would bless the nations, a suffering servant to forgive sins and save a people from all the nations, to save a people from all the peoples. So how do they get all these things? How do they get that? And Paul says you get it in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That means they need to become One with Jesus, right? Some of you are taking Pastor Nick's Union with Christ class. This is what he's talking about all the time. They're being one with Jesus. Him taking all their sins, them getting all of his righteousness, and them getting all the status, all the benefits that Jesus has. That's how you get the inheritance. That's how you're in the body. That's how you receive the promise. You get in Christ. You're with Christ. And how do you do that? Paul says it's through the gospel, which I take to mean by what he says right after this, that that you hear the good news of Jesus and you believe it. By faith, through grace, you come into this reality. So how does this relate to global focus? This is talking about the Gentiles, which is really just a word for nations or peoples. Paul is revealing here that all peoples... All nations, every tribe, every tongue can be in Christ if they hear and believe the gospel. Paul is revealing here that God is a global God. That Jesus is a global savior. Not a tribal God or even a national God or savior. He's not concerned with the building up of any one particular nation or people. He is concerned with creating one new man from all the nations and peoples. That's amazing news. This is a big revelation that Paul is giving right here. Isn't it great that for Global Focus Week, we didn't have to like go to a special passage. It's just in the letter from Paul saying this is what it means to be the church. This is what it means that God's gathering the nations. This is the mystery of Christ revealed in a new, full way. That is the gospel saving and unifying a people called the church. And we need churches for all peoples because God is worthy of global worship in his church. That's what Paul is saying here. Point number two, 
is that in the church, the riches of Christ are preached. So Paul, an unlikely choice, has been given the stewardship of grace to unveil God's plan for all peoples to come into his family called the church. Paul is writing to this local expression of that reality, this church in Ephesus. And what does he say he did with that stewardship he received? Here's what he says. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul is just affirming what we said before. God made him a servant by grace, right? I'm not a hero. I'm a servant. I'm the, the least of all the saints, having been saved by grace and called a minister by God's power. And if the mystery is that the church is created so that all the peoples can come into Christ through the gospel, what does Paul give his life to? Preaching the gospel, right? The church is created so that all peoples can come into Christ through the gospel, the church is created, like this is you, right? This is not someone far away. The church, you are created so that all peoples can come into Christ through the gospel. What should we give our lives to? Someone say it, right? Preaching the gospel, should we tell people about the good news that they might come into Christ, be a part of this, and then take it into their neighborhoods, into the nations, right? It's just a logical conclusion. Paul goes, I gave myself to it. God revealed that peoples would come into the church through Christ by hearing the gospel. And when I heard of that stewardship, you know what I did? I told them the gospel <laughs> over and over and over again. Preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Preaching the gospel to all peoples. He even says in Romans 15, he wants to preach where Christ has not been named. And that's what we see over and over again in the book of Acts. What does Paul do? Right, he goes somewhere, right, he makes tents during the day, <laughs> right, and then at night he goes and he preaches the gospel. And some people believe, and what does he do? He gathers them into a little church. He says, you're my gospel outpost, my, my lampstand here. And then what does he do? He moves on to a new place with a few people from that church, normally. And he preaches the gospel again. And some people believe, and he gathers them into a little church. And then what does he do? He goes to a new place with some people from that last church and he preaches the gospel, right? You can just see the pattern in Acts, him preaching where it hasn't yet been named, where there's no faithful churches yet established. And that's the logical conclusion. Preach the gospel, gather those who hear and believe into this new amazing reality of the church and then keep going. And Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 that we, the church, are ambassadors for Christ. Right, wherever we are, whatever nation we're in, right, whether we're sitting here in a ton of comfort today, or here we are, ambassadors for Christ in a place that, that shouldn't feel too much like home, or whether we're overseas in a place with chaos and war and bombings, right, there's a church there. Wherever we are, wherever we are, ambassadors for this good news ministers by God's grace and power of this same gospel that will help to reconcile people to God and bring them into his family. So what's our job? Our job is like Jesus, to, to see the helpless and harassed, to know this mystery is now revealed in the church, to, to preach the gospel, to bring people into the church, to, to care about the gospel being preached to all peoples where Christ is not yet named and see faithful churches gathered there. And kids, I just want to encourage you uh, to start this now. Start now being bold with the gospel. Start now before fear overtakes you. Start now before you're like all of us adults that have bad habits to break with our, our fears and our anxieties, right? Start now telling people this good news. If you trust in Jesus, even if you're six or seven or eight or nine or ten, you're a servant of Jesus, you get to tell people about Jesus, and sometimes when we tell people about Jesus, they believe and come into God's family. All of you heard the gospel from someone or somewhere, and you believed and came into God's family. That's how it works and how it's worked for 2,000 plus 
years. Maybe someday you'll be the one to go to some place where no one has yet heard of Jesus. Do you believe that, kids? That could be you. You could be the one to go and make much of Jesus. And adults, we should do this in our neighborhoods. And especially this week. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Just pray this week and consider if you should do this to the nations. All right, there's some global partners here today, and they're going to be set up out there, and they're going to have tables, and our, our, our Go team is going to be out there. And what you're going to find about these global partners is that they're awesome and normal. <laughs> they're awesome and normal, apart from God's grace. They're just like you, apart from God's call. They're just sitting here like you, and one day God said, you're going to go. And they're awesome and normal believers who want to make Jesus known to the nations. You should talk to them. Uh, point three. The wisdom of God is displayed, verses 10 to 12. So at the end of verse 9, it says that Paul is bringing to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So here's what Paul is saying. There is a God. That's a statement for our day. There is a God who created all things. That's a statement for our day. And there is a God who created all things who had something planned. And by his preaching, as Paul fulfills his ministry, he's bringing that plan into the light so that it can be fully seen by who? By everyone. That's a lot of people that God wants to see this plan. So what is brought to light and what is meant to be fully seen? Look at verses 10 and 11. That through the church, right, I'm not making up this church stuff, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a lot there, but notice three amazing things. First, notice how the wisdom of God is made known. What does it say? So that through what? Through the church. There are times I look at myself and us and go, that's a bad idea. <laughs> right? That is, not, that is not the best way to make this known. Right? We just don't seem like we're, we're that with it or that savvy or that clever or able to keep up. And sometimes we just seem angry and mad and frustrated. Like, that's how you're going to do it? And he says, yes. <laughs> I'm going to do it through the church. Through the people brought near by his blood. Through the people made one in his spirit. Through the people who are working to be at peace with God and each other and made to live out that unity in local expressions here and all around the world. That's who I'm going to work through. That's what he says. Right? So it's our job to do it, right? To just listen and hear the call. This isn't a, a condemnation. It's an invitation. Like if your life is boring or you're, you're bored with your Christianity and your devotion, it's like see how big the story is. <laughs> see how big the, the calling is for the church. And this is lived out here, amazingly, at South City's Church in Lakeville, Minnesota. Right? It's being lived out at Good News Church of Egan, our church plant over there. And it's being lived out at the new church plant of one of our global partners just started in India. All these gospel outposts, these lampstands in these dark places meant to do this, invite people into the kingdom of God. God's wisdom on display through the church. Second... Notice who Paul says this is revealed to. Paul says the plan is brought to light for everyone, which I think means like the whole world. This is going to spread to the ends of the earth. And he says it's to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The other place this phrase is used in Ephesians is Ephesians 6, where we need the armor of God to stand against them. Which is why most commentators say that this is the dark forces of evil. In other words, God is showing off his magnificence and his wisdom and his power and his glory and his saving purposes to the whole world and to all the forces of evil that would stand against him. So that as they look on, they go, we've lost. God keeps building his church. We keep trying to snuff it out and every time we do this thing explodes. God keeps building his church. And third, notice this is an eternal purpose finally realized in Jesus. The church is not a parenthesis or an accident. It has been the plan all along. (laughs) Church has been the plan all along. That means this was the plan from eternity past through eternity future, and it all came to be fulfilled in Jesus. All of history runs through Jesus Christ. So let's remember what he did. What did he do to to make this thing happen? Well, according to just Ephesians, 
He chose us. He adopted us, forgave us, redeemed us, made us alive together with Christ. Right? He seated us in the heavenly places. He saved us. He brought us near by his blood. He made us at peace with God. One man, one new temple, one holy temple, all in Christ. And who's in Christ? Well, God reveals that he will save people from both Jew and Gentile, every tribe, tongue, people, language, and nation to come into his people to create this new thing called the church to shine his glory to the world. What an amazing plan that no one else could have come up with. And how is he doing that? How does he mean to do that? Well, I think he means to do, do that by showing the world his forgiveness and redemption and peace and love and power and beauty through a church that lives out that forgiveness, that redemption, that peace, that love, and that power and that beauty with one another to a watching world. How will the world know we're disciples of Jesus by the way we love one another? Right? Our, our love for each other is not like in competition with our missions program. Our, our internal care and love is not at competition with our, our external love for the world. It, it all goes together. He's showing the demonic powers that they cannot win <laughs> by saving a people who no longer are fooled into numb foolish, confused stupors of sin and darkness and hopelessness, but who instead, according to verse 12, have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. It's amazing. You have boldness and access to the almighty God through faith in Jesus Christ. So that the demonic powers look on and they go, we can't win. They believe, and then they have access. He gives them full access. They can come to him, God's people, and God's place to enjoy God's presence. Generation after generation, church after church, people group after people group, and they just watch it all fall before them. Through the church. right? This is, this is crazy, but amazing news. God's people redeemed by God's son, Jesus in God's place, the church, to enjoy God's presence, boldness, and access with confidence by faith. Do you love the boldness and accidents, a- access you have? Do you love it? Do you want other people to have access to God through Jesus Christ by the Spirit? No longer do we need to go to the temple. We are the temple individually and together having access to the God of the universe who loves us purchased us and will bring us into his presence forever. And Paul's just saying, that's going to happen everywhere. So I wanted to tell people about it. (laughs) I wanted to tell everyone I would talk to about it. I wanted to go places where they hadn't hurt and tell them about it because they need to hear it because they got to have access. They got to get in here. There is no, there is no other place. There is no other institution that is more secure than the church of Christ. Like if you're going to pick a good investment, one that you know is going to pay off, a good place, a good institution, a good thing to be a part of, there is no other place or institution that is more secure with eternal reward than the church. God will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you worry, and we do, right? If you worry about other institutions or other powers or other realities taking over, you worry about them having too much Sway, they have too much sway, they have too much sway. Know that many institutions and powers have come and gone, but the church has remained. This is true, right? Know that empires, the most powerful empires in world history, have dedicated themselves to wiping out the church, and it grew. (laughs) So, what happens when you go against God? It's what happens when you go against the way that he's going to bring his glory and saving power to the nations. Because the king of kings and the Lord of lords is head of the church. There is no other power that can ever outdo us. He doesn't need to maneuver. He doesn't need to win a vote to have his purposes and plans come to fruition. He just keeps reigning. (laughs) He's not maneuvering right now. Like, how do I... What can I, what, what ad can I put out there? What sign? Like, what's clever? How am I going to get people to, right, to, to want to be a part of me again? Right? He, he's not like, how am I going to win the vote? Like, my hands are ringing. He just keeps reigning <laughs> where he always has been seated on high at the right hand of the Father. 
And he works through his church as it declares his wisdom to the whole world and to the demonic powers and declares that his purposes of redemption and salvation and eternal glory will stand and other, all other plans against him will fail. That's how the whole thing ends. It's how it's always been headed. It's how it's going to end. So finally here, the application, this worthy calling of suffering laborers. Look at verse 13. Paul, after saying all this, says, So I ask you, remember he's writing from prison, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. We saw in verse 1 that Paul is a prisoner, but I love the way Paul says it. He says what I just said. He says, I'm not a prisoner of Rome, though he was there three years under Roman guard. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ on behalf of the nations. So right, even in his imprisonment, he says, listen guys, the Roman government isn't in charge here. Jesus is in charge, and I'm happy to suffer for the nations to make the gospel known, see people saved, see a church gathered, and see God's wisdom shine into the world. The Roman government has no hold on me. I'm a prisoner of Christ for the sake of his name and his purposes. Isn't that a, like, just aside from everything else I've been saying, isn't that like in your suffering and your circumstances and your brokenness and all the things going on in your life, isn't that a great perspective to have? Like Jesus reigns. <laughs> Wherever I am, Jesus reigns. Wherever I am, Jesus is in control. Wherever I am, Jesus' purposes will come to pass. And I think that's what he means when he says it's for their glory. He means that he's in chains under the lordship of Christ because he's working that his church, his bride, will forever be in the glory of Christ. That's why he does it. It's what, he, what needs to continue to happen for the good of lost people and for God's global praise. So let me say it this way. We are all goers. We must all be goers. Right? That's not just a special group of people. Everybody has to go. We're all ambassadors. We're all far away from Jerusalem where it all started as ambassadors to the nations. Our neighbors need to hear the gospel preached and come into the family of God. And in fact, if you looked around and paid attention just to, to restaurants and places you shop and places you drive, many of the nations are coming to us. You can look around and you can see them all around us here in these south cities. So that's the call in all of us. None of us can escape that this morning. None of us can say, that's not my job, that's not my purpose. That, that's all of us. That's what Paul is calling us to here. But... There are still places where the gospel hasn't yet been preached and there are not faithful churches to display the wisdom of the eternal plan of God in Christ. Those places still exist. But there are people without any access to God. Here we are with bold access to God through Christ. There's people who have never even heard of Jesus Christ. They can't see his plan in Jesus. The dark forces of evil still hold sway there. We need gospel preaching to all nations, right? That's what he said the mystery is, and gospel churches to shine the light for generations to come. And Paul says that while it's a ministry of suffering, it leads to glory. So as I say, I've been praying, right, that someone would go to the nations, nine or 90, single couple, big family. I'm, I'm not praying in a lighthearted, filled with adrenaline kind of way. Like it's going to bring suffering, <laughs> Surely, I don't know what kind, but it's going to come with suffering. When you go to your, your neighbors, it might come with suffering. Just to be a, a Christian, right, is not that we got all the power and glory now. It's that all the power and glory is working for us. We're going to experience it someday, but right now we join Jesus on the sort of suffering. And that's what, what Paul says. A ministry of suffering that leads to glory, which is exactly what we should expect, isn't it? Right, Jesus came from glory, eternal glory, entered our mess. He suffered he died, and then he rose again that we might live in eternal glory, suffering death that leads to glory. Right? And so his gospel marches on through those who look on the nations with compassion, <laughs> see him as harassed and helpless. Though who see, those who see God's plan that all peoples have access to the eternal inheritance, to come into the household of God, to be partakers of the promises, those who see that the gospel must be preached so that people can be saved from their sins and gathered into churches where God's wisdom and glory can shine brightly for people to see and for darkness to be driven away. People who see God's global gospel mission in the church and say, yeah, I'll suffer for it. 
suffer for because the suffering is going to lead to glory. Right? I'll, I'll leave comfort. I'll leave family. I'll leave routines. I'll leave whatever else that it might bring others into eternal glory by God's gracious gospel. I feel like one of the least of the saints, but I'm going to go. I'm going to suffer that others might come in. I'll suffer with boldness and confidence, knowing I'm always in God's presence no matter where I am. So this God's eternal plan in Christ, others might come into his presence with me and eventually worship alongside me around the throne of God for all eternity. I will go because he saved me, he's brought me near, and he's worthy of global praise. And as I look on the harass and helpless, I go, that was me. <laughs> that was me, and God came down and pursued me with goodness and mercy, saved me, brought me into his family, and oh, how I want that for all the peoples. So the call is on all of us here, and on some of us, <laughs> some of us to go where Christ has not yet been named, where churches are not yet established, that people would be saved brought in and God's glory and wisdom would shine to everyone into the powers of darkness saying, our Savior reigns. He will reign and he's going to come back soon and make all things new. Let's pray. So Lord, we, we're going to come and eat and drink with you now this uh, communion supper that is being enjoyed by churches all around the world, places where you've made your gospel shine, where believers have been gathered, where the forces of darkness see that they've lost, where everyone can see the kindness and goodness and forgiveness, not perfectly, but on display in your church. So we come and we, we eat this meal as a family here, a local expression of your family here in Lakeville, Minnesota, Lord, we pray that your glory would shine, your wisdom would shine through us to the South Cities, Lord. And I pray that some of us here would see how good, how sweet this is and say, I want that for those who are in the nations and don't yet know Jesus, haven't yet heard of Jesus, where there's no churches yet established to shine his glory and wisdom. And they would go, Lord. So as we come and eat this meal, Lord, work in us. Uh, Work in us what's pleasing in your sight. Help us lay down our sins and our burdens and our brokenness and be reminded of your grace and your eternal plan that came to fruition in Christ and is made known now through the church. What a privilege we have to come to you now. Boldness and access to you as a family and individually right now we have, Lord. Help us not take it for granted. In Jesus' name, amen.